In this video, we'll look at the optimization of resolution. In the last video, I defined resolution as an empirical parameter, r sub s, defined as the difference in retention time of two peaks, such as these, divided by the average of the width of those peaks. Now, since it's difficult to actually measure the width accurately, we instead measure the width at half height and use this relationship here to define resolution. Now let's look at factors contributing to resolution. The equation shown here is called the Purnell equation. In this equation, resolution RS is given as the product of the square root of the number of theoretical plates divided by 2, the selectivity minus 1 divided by the selectivity for two given peaks. Remember, selectivity alpha is defined as the adjusted retention time of one peak divided by the adjusted retention time of another peak. And this term is multiplied by the retention factor of the second of two peaks to elute divided by one plus that same retention factor. And remember, the retention factor is defined by the adjusted retention time for that second peak divided by the minimum time, or the dead time, for the experiment. In the next few slides, we're going to examine the contributions of these three terms of the Purnell equation. First, we're going to look at this concept of n, theoretical plates. The term plate comes from distillation theory. It refers to one discrete step in which a separation event occurs. Since a plate is a single separation event, a small plate height means that you can have more effective plates in a column, and the more plates you have in a column, the narrower your peaks will be, and the better resolved they will be. A plate is a, a theoretical construct. It's not a real entity that we can observe. But since the plate height is related to peak width, plate height can be defined theoretically as the standard deviation of the Gaussian peak squared divided by the distance through the column that the peak has traveled. To put this definition into any kind of practical use, we can take the simple relationship that the number of plates in a column is simply the length of the column divided by the height of the plates, as defined here. And then given that x is the total length of the column once the peak elutes and is observable, we can define the number of plates as the retention time of a peak squared divided by the standard deviation, or the variance, of the peak squared. And in practical terms of the width at half height, this can be expressed as 5.55 times the retention time of any peak squared divided by the width at half height squared for that peak. This is the critical relationship that is most frequently used in chromatography for defining the number of theoretical plates, and then, once given the length of the column, empirically measuring the height of a theoretical plate in that column. So in HPLC, we can increase the number of theoretical plates by simply making the column longer. Here we see the resolution of two peaks in a 50 millimeter column versus the resolution of two peaks in a 100 millimeter column. And we see that a longer column leads to more plates and better resolution. But the problem with making a column longer is that we have to push a viscous mobile phase through more stationary phase particles. And this creates high pressure. So in practicality, the length of an HPLC column is limited by the pressure that the instrument can generate. If you exceed that pressure, the plumbing literally breaks open and mobile phase leaks everywhere. And when this happens, you have to stop your experiment and fix the leak before you can proceed. Another way to get more theoretical plates in a column is to use smaller particles. Here we see separation in a 50 millimeter column with 5 micron particles. And here we see separation in the same column with 1.7 micron particles. 
and the peaks are narrower because smaller particles lead to more surface area and thus more plates. But once again, this increased surface area creates more back pressure. And thus there are, all, there are practical limits to how small the particle size can be in HPLC. A 100 millimeter column with 5 micron particles are actually fairly standard column parameters. Returning to the Purnell equation, we can see here that the first term, the square root of the number of theoretical plates divided by 2, can be improved by using either a longer column or smaller particles. However, there's also a third factor in optimizing the number of theoretical plates, and that is flow rate. The relationship between flow rate and theoretical plates is given by the Van Diemter equation. When attempting to optimize column efficiency in chromatography, we can calculate the resolution at a series of flow rates and plot the Van Diemter equation to find the optimum column efficiency. You will be doing this in both chromatography modules in this class. The Van Diemter equation relates the height of a theoretical plate in your column to three parameters, A, B, and C, as a function of the flow rate. Parameter A is called the eddy diffusion or multiple paths coefficient. As your solute travels through the pores of your stationary phase, it can take alternative paths through the pores. And since some of these paths are a little longer and some of these are a little shorter, some solutes will take a shorter path and some will take a longer path. And this parameter A then contributes to the diffusion or broadening of the peak as a result. Plotted on its own, parameter A is a constant that is completely independent of flow rate. Next, we can look at parameter B, or the longitudinal diffusion coefficient. The relationship between parameter B and flow rate is hyperbolic because parameter B describes the result of a particle diffusing during separation. The longer an analyte remains in the mobile phase, the more time its initially narrow band has to diffuse outward from its central high concentration region. So peak will naturally start out very sharp early on and will always become broader and broader and broader. As a result, when your flow rate gets very slow, this longitudinal diffusion results in greater peak broadening when the peaks finally loot from the column. Finally, the parameter C is the equilibrium time coefficient and it is a linear function of flow rate. Increasing the flow rate decreases the time available to a particle to officially equilibrate with the stationary phase, and then you get inefficient non-equilibrium mass transfer. As a result, rushing your solute through the column will result in fewer effective theoretical plates, peak broadening, and lower resolution. Together, these three parameters contribute to a Van Diemter plot function that looks something like this when plotted for real data. In practice, we measure the height of theoretical plates from the retention time, the width at half height, and the column length at different flow rates, plot the resulting curve, and use the minimum that we get from this analysis as our flow rate for optimal column efficiency. So now that we've examined all the factors in our control for optimizing theoretical plates, what about these other factors that contribute to the resolution? So alpha, also known as the selectivity or relative retention, is given by the ratio of the adjusted retention time of two solutes, which is also proportional to their equilibrium and kinetic partition coefficients. This relationship between partitioning, and retention time is the physical basis of chromatography. And to get the greatest ratio possible, we need to amplify the relative partitioning behavior of two analytes. The primary ways we have of adjusting selectivity this way is through appropriate selection of mobile and stationary phases. 
For example, in liquid chromatography, we can see the separation of the same six components in acetonitrile, methanol, and ethanol. Each of these mobile phases has an effect on selectivity in different ways. The details of mobile phase selection are beyond the scope of this course, but I just wanted to illustrate this concept because it is another tool we have for optimizing separation in chromatography. The final issue I want to mention is peak asymmetry. So far, our analysis of the Purnell equation has assumed symmetric peaks. Sometimes our peaks are not symmetric, and the direction of the asymmetry has different causes. So when we see peaks that look like this, this is known as overloading and occurs when too much sample is injected onto the column. And so we can reduce overloading and improve peak symmetry by simply injecting less sample. When the shape of the peak is asymmetric in the other way, this is called peak tailing. Peak tailing is caused by some sites in the stationary phase retaining the solute more than others. Sometimes peak tailing can be reduced by changing the column if the properties of the stationary phase are degrading over time. Sometimes adding mobile phase additives such as acids, bases, or other species that will interact with the stationary phase can improve peak tailing. And sometimes changing the mobile phase altogether can affect peak tailing. Again, the details of how to deal with peak tailing are beyond the scope of this class, but you should know that peak tailing can only be reduced by changing either the stationary phase or the mobile phase in some way. To summarize what we've just covered, separation is based upon differential partitioning and migration between stationary and mobile phases. The area under a peak in a chromatogram is proportional to the amount of the analyte present. Chromatogram parameters of retention time and peak width can be used to calculate resolution, an important parameter that we want to optimize. Resolution can be optimized by increasing the number of theoretical plates in the column, and we can increase the number of theoretical plates by increasing column length, decreasing particle size, and optimizing the flow rate through Van Diemter analysis. Resolution can also be optimized through modulation of selectivity, and to do that, we can choose a different stationary phase or mobile phase for our separation. And finally, peak asymmetry, which can affect resolution, is due to either overloading the column or variations in the stationary phase composition, which can be minimized through the addition of mobile phase additives or changing the stationary phase. Depending on whether you're doing the liquid or gas chromatography module, the next video will be focused on the specifics of either liquid or gas chromatography.